but uh, time to talk rugby. Alan Quinlan, good morning to you. Morning, Adrian. How are you? Flying it, thanks. Alan Quinlan, host of the Red 78 podcast, all your monster fix. Head along to the Rugby Channel now and you can uh, pick up the latest from that. Uh, team news obviously in, Quinny, since you were last on and the standout things. 12 Leinster players in the 15, Sexton 100 caps, Porter loose head, Kelleher hooker, Sheehan to get his shot off the bench, Lowe is back, Murray benched and no Zebo. Where do you want to jump in? Well, if you're a Munster fan, you're disappointed or an Ulster or a Connacht one, aren't you? But uh, look, I think um, it's a very, very strong side. I think a um, uh, very powerful side. A lot of the players under Cook, that would be my concern. Um, some of the internationals, um, the kind of, the ones that went back to their provinces, their, obviously their season was a little bit slower than others and some of them haven't uh, that many games but um, you mentioned the front row there and I was just thinking about this Adrian um, Porter, Lucid and Kelleher and Furlan that's potentially um, a world class front row I think Ronan Kelleher has come on so much and obviously his experience with the Lions and training with them over the summer will benefit him um, the way he started the season has been fantastic he's such a powerhouse um, athletic and 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 really his game is I think has improved so much. One area is the line out and you get tested more at, at the top level with that. But having Porter and and Furlong on the field at the same time is obviously something that the Irish selectors and uh, have taught have taught about and the Irish management have taught about and um, it can only add benefit to Ireland. I think, you know, Keelan Healy obviously has been fantastic over the years, but and he's had such a wonderful career. But I think having Porter and Furlong on together, they're two really good footballers. They get the ball in their hands a lot. So that front row is is a, is a serious outfit. Um, you you have him, develop. Quinny. Sorry, you have Kelleher in. We were talking to Fiona Hayes about it yesterday, and she was kind of saying it was more of a horses for courses thing, maybe between himself and Herring. But you have Kelleher in clear number one. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I think... Um, uh, Herring has been very good for Ireland. I think he's he's a very dynamic player and he does a lot around the field as well and he's in the loose and stuff like that. But I think Keller is the full package. If The difference between the two of them is the line-out throwing. Herring's throwing is really, really brilliant. It's top, top-notch. top mm. There's still a little question mark there over Ron Keller with the throwing when you come up against the big sides and um, the accuracy and even a couple against Japan were, were inaccurate. Um, I'm sure he's worked in that, and you know, having Paul been involved with the team will benefit him and just get the timing of throw, throws and stuff like that. But I think he's he, he is number one, he has to be number one, he's the future now, and I think he's a, a, a fantastic player. Uh, when you look at the profile of the 23, and particularly the likes of Omani, Murray, Earls. <laughs> Um, Healy on the bench like I was interested in the comment you made earlier on about the the uh, undercooked nature of the players does that explain the inclusion of some of those Quinny because there's nothing new we're going to learn about those players uh, particularly off the bench No and I think um, there is a lot of experience with Peter Mahoney Conor Murray Keith Earls they, they bring you know an incredible amount of caps and experience with them um, I think he's trying to be fair to them they are a little bit undercooked as regards matches um, I think they're still important part of this squad, um, and I think they'll they'll. That's probably one of the reasons we haven't seen. You know, Conor Murray is only has he one or two games played. Um, Keith Earls is only a couple of games played as well. I know a lot of the other players are in similar situations, but um, there was probably a lot of a lot of people wanted to see a lot more change. But I think there's there's been a lot of New players come into Andy Farrell's squad in the last eighteen months, and a lot of he's capped a lot of players as well. So um, you can't have wholesale changes, and I think it's a very strong side. And as you say, it's probably because they're undercooked a little bit, but we haven't seen enough of those players yet um, this season. But I think they will be important, and I think the the lack of kind of younger. Um, chip players and abandonment as regards selection is down to New Zealand next week. Um, Japan is going to be a very difficult game for them, but they've got to get some sort of continuity. Normally this time of year, they'd have European games played. Um, they've had a lot more 
uh, league games played as well. So I think this team need, needs a game or it's going to be very, very... It's going to be difficult against Japan. There's no doubt about it. And they're a very dangerous side. But I think this team needs a game together and the team which he's going to pick next week, which there might be some changes on it, but the vast majority of these, 20, these 23 players will be going out against New Zealand next week. And Quinny, for you, did you hope that it might have been a bit more adventurous? I think fans sort of hoped against Japan. You might see the likes of maybe, I don't know, Craig Casey or Robert Balakloon, you know, these type of lads to get in and then get their start now, because I don't think we will see that and then against the All Blacks. <laughs> Yeah, well, we won't see it actually against the All Blacks, but I think there is there is an opportunity to give um, to do that against um, Argentina in the last game. I think it's very, I think it'd be very foolish to mix and match and and essentially, okay, people always argue this at the World Cup that we kind of pick mm -hmm. teams to win matches uh, rather than you know, with one eye in the World Cup. It's okay for England to do that and for New Zealand to do that in South Africa because they have such a big pool of players. Um, and and maybe, you know, that criticism keeps coming around every four years. But I think in the last 12 to 18 months, as I said, Andy Farrell has brought in a lot of young players and capped a lot of young players in this squad. The age profile at the moment is 29. That's the average age. And it's probably the bench that brings that up a lot and Johnny Sexton in the side. Um, but look, um, I think Balakun is someone who would really, really excite me. And if you were going to do it, mm -hmm. um, maybe it's in those wider channels. I, I'd love to see Jordan Larmer get back a bit of zip in his game and, and be, a, be a, have a real impact at international level as well. I think he has incredible X factor. Craig Casey has shown that he's matured and developed a lot. But I think probably what, what happened at the end of the Six Nations was Gibson Park probably put his hand up to, you know, be the number one uh, scrum half. I know Conor Murray will have something to say about that. He went to the line store. But um, I think it's going to happen against Argentina. And mm -hmm. it would be foolish to, to change for the sake of it in this game because I think it's going to be very, very difficult. And I know you can't, you have to be, you'd be foolish to think, look ahead too much next week. I think it's just uh, New Zealand because Japan will cause them a lot of problems and they, they're a side that could potentially beat Ireland. They're a very dangerous side. Yeah. They showed that again in the last couple of weeks. So I don't think you make changes just for the sake of it. I hope to see some of the younger players, the squad, um, get get opportunities like Balakloon, like James Hume. Um, Dan Sheehan is on the bench. Um, Nick Timoney, maybe, you know, players like that. Gavin Coombs. I hope we see them against Argentina. You talk about the uh, options around uh, the back three, particularly, Quinny. James Lowe spoke very well yesterday about learning from his Six Nations experience and well documented, obviously, the troubles that he had at that time and yeah. ultimately getting dropped down for the England game. Is it likely or possible? Like, he's talking about it very positively in terms of great experience to go through, learnt my lesson, I've worked really hard, I'm going to come back and that's all going to be fixed. Is that likely or possible? It's difficult when you're not a... When, when I suppose you, you can learn as a defender and um, learn not to, you know, to stay connected what's happening on the inside. And I've thought about this. Some, some people I played with over the years and watched, obviously, they do it naturally where they, they kind of, even if they don't have a huge amount of pace, that they have this ability to stay in an inside shoulder and, and push players out and not come up and in where a pass goes over their head or they, they just get caught with the numbers. I think James Lowe's natural instinct is to, to come up and in. And that's what happened a few times in, in, in those matches where he got cut out, particularly the Welsh game. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, it's probably the re it's, it is the reason why he's dropped his defence because, you know, we saw a James Lowe for a couple of years who was on the front foot with Leinster and who was so dominant and energetic and coming in off his wing and making lots of carries. His kicking game is good. So there's undoubted talent there. And... I think he's he's some can it be fixed? Yes, it can, but I think he has to understand, and I hope he understands not, what's happened and what he needs to do. Um, because the point I'm making, it comes natural to some people where they can defend in a way that they don't panic and they'll come up. And, and James has probably shown a little bit of panic because he wants to be physical and he wants to smash people as well. Mm. But defense is about being intelligent. 
So sometimes you're better off actually soaking a tackle. When I mean soaking is 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 making the tackle back across your de- game line a bit, rather than taking the 60-40 of making a big smash and knocking them back on the other side, particularly when in the wider channel. So it's a difficult place to defend. And, um, you know, he can offer a lot to this team if he gets that right, and I hope he does. And, you know, he's he was pretty honest and he's in assessment, and um, I'm sure they've worked hard on that, and he's worked hard as, as an individual. So the proof will be in the pudding, um, you know, that he makes good decisions defensively, particularly tomorrow. And... Uh, He'll be tested a lot because, you know, Japan have so much pace and accuracy in their game that they move the ball a lot. Yeah, I mean, you look at the options that are there. He might not get a huge amount more chances well, as well. It's a, it's an and it's an area, Adrian, that you could you can realistically say and 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 factually say that you know in the la- there's been a lot of chopping and changing with the wings. I think Hugo Keenan probably. Given a little bit of stability at full back now that you know you kind of think he's the first choice full back there and he's he's proved himself. There's been a lot of you know, some players have been injured. Keith Derrick's has been there a long time and he's missed matches through injury and he's been in and out. And um, but you know, have we two wingers that have just nailed down those spots in the last number of years and are part of the future, the, the growth towards the World Cup? Not really, and yeah. that's 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 a worry. So these positions are up for grabs and 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 it's now that, that players need to start putting their hands up there. Um, and that's why I mentioned Balakun and Ashton did as well. You know, he's someone that, you know, um, Keith Earls is still a top quality player and I think he's he's a, he's a, he's a battler and he's he's great pace to his game and he's been brilliant for Ireland. He's not going to be there forever and I think the door is kind of slightly ajar for someone to grab that spot there on the right wing and you know, Larmer is another player I'd love to see back. As I said, Stockdale, um, wonderful attacking player, but defensive issues as well over the years. Mm. So um, you need a bit of continuity there. And I think now in the next six months, we need to start finding players who are going to nail that down and and take hold of those jerseys, the 11 and 14 jerseys, and and give real options of counter attack and and ability in um in wider channels uh, as regards to them being wingers you know yeah I was down at the Aviva supporting Connacht a couple of weeks ago, Quinny, and got a good look at Balakoon up close and uh, and Mac Hansen as well. So look, a good, good options. Come here, we better talk about Sexton one hundred because there's not many players in an Irish shirt that have reached this milestone. Uh, in fact, only Hayes, Healy, O'Connell, Best, Raj, and Brian O'Driscoll have more caps than him. It is we we tended over the last couple of years to talk a lot about his age. At times, where there's been short, some shortcomings, but we should talk about. What a powerhouse this guy's been in an Irish shirt for 12 years now. Yeah, he's been brilliant. And and I was in the Irish squad when he kind of came in first and started training with Ireland. Um, he was quiet, shy. Um, and people weren't really sure, even from a Leinster point of view, how good he was and what, what kind of an impact. Was he good enough at this level? And, you know, obviously he came on for Kanzapomi in that final, semi-final in 09 and played really well and then delivered in the final and it, it, the whole narrative changed around Johnny, Johnny Sexton and uh, he started to have an impact with Ireland then and there was a battle between himself and Rog for that number 10 jersey and they ended up playing together a couple of times with Sexton and, and coming off the bench and being in the centre or, or vice versa. So... Um, I think a little bit unsure at the start what to make of him when he came into the squad um because he was quiet and and a little standoffish but and what was that how, how did that probably came out. It, did, it did it did how, how did that manifest itself on the training pitch like that quietness was that uh was well, he... I think you know there would have there would have been a lot of experienced players there and he was a young player coming in and you know you, you're not really sure um you know, so I, I often look to players, whether it be provincially or with nationally over the years, and not really sure. Some guys, you look at them and you think, geez, they're going to be an international, they're a quality player. Um, obviously, from a you know kicking point of view and place kicking and, and kicking a touch and all that stuff, um, he was very good at all that stuff. But you just weren't sure, was he a real out-and-out attacking player and had the ability? And out-half is a really tough position. And look, look at... You know the players who've come through since that time, and um, they don't come around top quality out halves too often, and they're hard positions to fill. But 
I think he just grew and grew over the years and became more confident. And obviously the success with Leinster kind of kicked on, gave him the confidence with Ireland. And uh, he's been involved in so many big games over the years and so integral to that success. And, you know, going to Paris and coming back and then probably being under, you know, coached by Joe Schmidt, um, who really pushed on his game as well. So the achievement is, is incredible. And it's difficult at times because... When you have a 36 year old player which he is now who's who's your 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 out half and he's had so much success people are going to try and you know wait look for weaknesses and <laughs> and poor games and then they put it straight down to the age so he's going to have to that's what happens when you continue playing on at this age uh, people one bad game he's too old um and that's that's something that's going to keep going uh, for him, but look, what he's achieved in the game is sensational. You know, he's such a determined player. Um, he probably drives himself cuckoo at times with that determination and drive, and I mean that in a respectful way. That you know, I can relate a tiny little bit to that that pressure you put on yourself, and he puts immense pressure on himself. It can be very good at times, but sometimes he looks stressed. He looks angry. Mm. He looks, you know, and we've all seen that. We've seen the temperament, and look. It's what drives him on as Medin Gray too, you know. So I, I really hope that, you know, I'd like to see it be a, a great ending for Johnny Sexton, whether it be this next year or if he goes to the World Cup. Um, you know, it's everybody will have an opinion on should he, um, but we haven't seen players come and take the jersey off him and yeah. he's still very much important part of it. But the achievement is incredible. And. Quinny, just as you spoke about there, like over the last while, people have criticised, and that seems when we talk about Johnny Sex, and that's what we talk about, rather yeah. than his unbelievable athleticism, what an athlete he is, and obviously he's at a hundred caps now. This is amazing. You know, we're obsessed with age. Is that a bit of a problem, maybe, in the game, in sports? I suppose as a whole. Um, yeah, but it's it's a natural thing, Ashley, because you know none of us. <laughs> Unfortunately, when you get to that age where maybe you're you have a bad game or a couple of bad games, or you, or or sometimes you think you can go on forever. Um, mm -hmm. I probably could have went on for another year at the end of my career, and it was one of my biggest fears that I would start kind of um, you know my performances start dipping and people start feeling sorry for you and stuff like that. And um, it's always a danger in sport when you go past the kind of age that you're supposed to the narrative is you know in rugby that you know you got the 33 34 35 maybe if you're lucky and some exceptions of course that players go on longer um it's down to physical and mental desire and and how you look after yourself and it's a shame really at times because at the point i suppose you're making is it's sometimes your a person's legacy can be kind of shredded a little bit and you look mm. at what Conor Murray and Johnny Sexton as a partnership did for a number of years. They did it on the British and Irish lines. They did it for Ireland. They brought on priest to them to success. You know, I know there'll always be the criticism of the World Cup. And, and it's difficult to deal with that. But 2018 in Twickenham, I did the commentary for that game. And, you know, they were in an incredible position to win a Grand Slam on Paddy's Day against our biggest rivals um, was really special. They won a number of championships, um, achieved so much in the game. And, you know, it's kind of sad at times that, but that's ruthless, the ruthlessness of professional sport that, you know, you get to the point maybe that um, you can still offer a lot, but maybe it's in a different way. And it's up to coaches to make those decisions and people have opinions Social media is crazy now with opinions and it can be really negative towards people in sport and like that and that situation. But um, they've got to deal with it. And that's, you either walk away or you deal with it, Ashton. You know, you've got to take mm -hmm. the good with the bad. And um, yeah. he still believes, he still believes he can deliver. So um, let's hope he does. And um, if he's part of the group going on to the World Cup, would be it would be a great story, you know. Yeah.
It looks inevitable almost. Now, I did want to, it wouldn't be a Friday morning without asking you something about running a Gareth's column in the Irish Examiner, so I want to ask you that before we get your, your thought, final thoughts on the game. He was talking about his own 100th cap and how he'd come on as a sub against South Africa in 2010. One of the November internationals had a bit of a positive impact on it and ended up losing the game ultimately in the end. But when he went to New Zealand and he sat down with a couple of the players, they were picking through with him when he won his 100th cap and why he came off the bench, and who was the co- who was the coach at that time, i.e. that it was uh, disrespectful to put him on the bench for his 100th cap, and he goes into some detail in that. Um, uh, he talks about the lack of respect and decency, not in relation to himself, but it does feel like a pointed comment. And Declan Kidney, obviously, was the coach at that time. Uh, it wasn't something, I have to say, I, from the outside looking in, that you, you would overly think about, but clearly, as players, it, it cuts deep. Um, your thoughts about that dynamic, Quinny, that like your hundred cap, you got to get in and like we all know Raj is a bit, uh, you know, he's, he's going to tell it like it is. But, uh, but is he, is he, is he, it, do you want me to tell it like it is? Is he, is he right? Yeah. Is he right to feel that way? Should he have started? Uh, probably. Yeah. Look at your, on your hundred cap. I, I think, um, uh, my, my 200 cap from Munster, it's a little bit different in Tolman Park was, home game to Ospreys and Tony McGahan back then was making changes in the team and he made the changes and I think Pat Gerrity was our PRO at the time mm. and um, Pat went, uh, came to me and said it's your 200 game at the weekend and I didn't even know that and he said I'm, I'm going to talk to the coach and and tell him because he's he's picked the team and you're, you're on the bench this week and there was a bit of rotation we came back from Edinburgh after winning a game on the previous Friday night and um, and then fairness to Tony McGahan, he said, look, it's your 200 cap, you've got to start. He went to, I think it could have been James Collin or Niall Rohner or someone said, look, I'm sorry, lads, I have to, I, he has to start. So I ended up running out in the field. So it was really nice because I didn't know about that. I'm sure Rog feels that way too, but uh, maybe he didn't say it at the time or uh, I don't know it was it was well it's an awkward conversation look, to have at, at that level is particularly isn't it like you know yeah, it like like particularly when, 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 when his starting point is could you not have had the respect for me to put me in the team sort of thing like it's hard to you know it's not it's not a, he wasn't arguing it from a I deserve to start point of view and I'm, I'm yeah, sure he, yeah. by the way I'm sure he'd also make that case but you know yeah, and it's different for me and Raj because uh, we're, we're, we're very close um, and I have no sympathy whatsoever for him because he's 124 <laughs> caps for Ireland. Yeah. And I've, tw- I've 27, so uh, I, I said this to him towards the end of his career, stop whinging and whining. Like, I wish I had 20 of his caps. Could he lend me 20 of them? So, um, no, but look, I know where he's coming from. And in fairness, the relationship between himself and Declan was... I wouldn't say fraught, but they, they, they challenged each other a lot. They were both from Cork. They knew each other from a young age. And I wasn't really privy to, to that dynamic. Um, I'd say it's, I, I wouldn't say it was anything cynical. And I don't know. I can't remember the game and who start, who did start at 10 before him and stuff like that. But he should have piped up at the time, sexton. maybe. But, but look, at the end of the day, if it is your 100, you would like to to be running out there at the start and I can't I didn't even know that that happened and I didn't see the article this morning but I'm sure he'll be fine he's he's achieved so much in the game anyway as well so he'll be grand he'll he's like... doing a bit of whining about that now at this stage <laughs> he'll get over it. Ireland's 10 that day was bum, 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 Jonathan Sexton right okay so there you go um... well he should have he, sh- he should have got his uh, he should have said it to someone beforehand so but look maybe no to be fair to Rog and it's a very relevant point. Uh, my 200 for months are totally different. Your 100 cap for Ireland, you should have started that game for sure. Fair enough. What's going to happen, uh, Ireland, Japan? It's tricky, isn't it? I think they've only, uh, let me see, is it four games played since the World Cup? That's all. Um, yeah. They played the, the Sun Wolves in, in, uh, before those summer tests. It was a kind of a, a warm up game, 32 17. The, the Lions game, I think, was 28-10. And the Lions started off in a very strong position there. But when you think of that and look at that result, it's an 18-point win for the British and Irish Lions against Japan. Um, and you couldn't argue that. You couldn't say that, oh, this is a national team and they're together all the time, they're training, because they weren't because of COVID and stuff. 
So they're very, very capable, the Japanese, of causing um, any side problems. And I think they've become stronger and, and physical. And um, I was looking back at some of the results last night and there's some big scores. I played in 2005 in Japan. We won two test matches there. And, you know, you kind of have the opinion back then that this is a bit easier. And, and you know, they're very quick and fast. And if you give them enough ball, they can be dangerous. But we'll, we'll overpower them up front. And teams can't really do that to them as convincingly as they did before because they're they're dynamic and they have a fair bit of power and strength there as well now so very dangerous side they showed it against australia a couple of weeks ago so if if i if we think or anyone thinks that this is going to be a 20 30 point game it's not um winning this game by seven or eight ten points is, is a good result i think what i'd like to see from ireland adrian is is them to be a bit more robust and powerful in defensively. They got a lot of line breaks, Japan, um, against us in that summer test, uh, which was 39, 31, eventually in the end. But they, there was a few sighs in the Aviva. Um, there was no crowds uh, for that game, but there was you could feel the, from the players that they were in, in a little bit of shock. So it'd be a good achievement to kind of stop those line breaks because I think Japan are probably the best attacking side in the world. When, when they're on the front foot, it's just they play with pace and accuracy and it's it's just electric at times. Um, so I think to stop that would be an achievement and win the game. I don't want us to be boring. I think we need to attack ourselves, hopefully, and score some good tries. Um, but it's a tricky game for Ireland. And because they're a little bit undercooked, I'd be nervous about <laughs> getting this perfect performance. I don't think we will get that. I just mm. think a win and be strong defensively. Yeah. All right. We'll watch you with interest and catch up with you next week. Thanks, Quinny. Cheers. Thanks, lads. Thanks a lot. That's Alan Quinlan looking ahead to the weekend's game.